Hey guys and welcome back to the channel and this time we're going to be talking about this Philips P3120 desktop PC. I actually got two of them. They are in pretty rough shape cosmetically but that shouldn't be that much of an issue. And the fact that I have two of them increases the odds of fixing at least one and if I'm a bit lucky hopefully I'll be able to pass one of them along to another retro PC enthusiasts. Pretty basic PCs, nothing too fancy. They did need a little bit of a cleanup, so I cleaned up the case. I don't have all of the footage here, but here you can see I'm using some baking soda to get some of the, the marks off of the case, and it cleaned up pretty nicely. So it was a pretty nice day, so an uh, ideal time to do some uh, retro PC cleaning. And on the inside, things are looking pretty good as well. It looks really clean. And the first thing I noticed was this old Western Digital hard drive that was there. It's not an MFM hard drive, but I suspect this is some kind of XT IDE hard drive. And there was also this weird white residue on the keyboard connector. No idea what that is. So after taking it inside, time for the smoke test. And although it does seem to power on, I didn't get any screen output. Now, now as you already saw, I have two of these machines and one of these machines had this 16-bit video card from Chips and Technologies. It was branded Philips, made in Canada, and it has both a 9-pin and a 15-pin D-sub connector. So this is a card which you can configure using these dip switches to output various display modes, ranging from MDA, Hercules, CGA, EGA, and of course VGA. I was a bit surprised to see a 16-bit video card in this 8-bit system, but anyways. I wanted to try a different video card, so I have this CGA 8-bit video card here that should work well with an old monitor that I still have laying around here. So let's give this a try. And you can see that the computer boots right off the bat on this monochrome monitor that does both MDA, Hercules, CGA and EGA. So let's see how much memory we have here. So it counts all the way up to 640, no, 768 kilobytes. But we immediately get an internal hard disk not ready error message, followed by a boot error prompting us to reboot using Control alt delete Now it is initializing both floppy drives, both the three and a half inch and the five and a quarter inch floppy drive, but obviously it's not booting because we haven't have a disk yet. Now one thing I noticed that when I turned on the PC, I didn't hear the hard drive spinning. So I could hear the fan of the power supply, but it seems like the hard drive was completely dead. So I decided to remove the hard drive and take a closer look. So it's clipped into the case using this kind of metal chassis. And this is a really cool old Western digital hard drive. It's not your standard IDE hard drive and it's not an MFM hard drive either, but instead this is an XT IDE hard drive marked by the X letter in the type number. So here you can see the stepper motor. It is attached to this kind of metal chassis and the connector seems like a standard IDE connector, but it's not at all compatible with the IDE AT interface that we know from a lot of uh, old computers. So finding a replacement drive for this is going to be extremely difficult. I imagine lots of them have gone bad or have been thrown out. But to my surprise, when I turned on the machine, as I just had the hard drive laying on top of it, I noticed that the hard drive was indeed spinning, so that seemed like a good thing. But unfortunately, I still had the internal hard disk not ready message. So I decided to boot from a five and a quarter inch floppy into MS-DOS. And there I noticed obviously that there was no C drive and also FDisk couldn't find any partitions or any fixed disks. So obviously we first need to get rid of this internal hard disk not ready error message. And there was also this ominous noise when you turn off the PC. Let's take a listen. Now a friend of mine once told me that tapping the side of hard drive with a screwdriver sometimes helps. So let's see if this manhandling had somewhat of an effect. Let's do its memory test first. 
And what do you know, we get an internal hard disk ready message, which is definitely better than the previous not ready message. So let's again boot from our MS-DOS floppy and I'm using uh, a five and a quarter inch floppy drive and it automatically assigns the drive letter A to it as soon as you boot from that drive, which is pretty neat. So let's see if the three and a half inch drive works. So let's insert a disk and do a directory listing. But unfortunately we get an error. And indeed, that three and a half inch floppy drive does make a, a weird noise. That definitely doesn't sound normal, so we'll need to take a look at that also. Now the computer does use a standard floppy drive interface, so it is pretty easy to replace the floppy drive with another one. So here I have another three and a half inch disk uh, floppy drive. Uh, obviously we need to make sure that it will fit in the five and a quarter inch bezel of the original PC but it was just to check if I would be able to replace the uh, floppy disk drive with another one at a later date and it worked absolutely fine so it was able to read 1.44 megabyte disks so that seems to work like a charm now let's take a look at the three and a half inch disk drive, which is enclosed in this five and a quarter inch drive bay. So we can remove it easily. And the thing is that um, you already noticed that there are three electrolytic capacitors there. Now these are very error prone for leaking. And there is some greenish residue on the legs of the electrolytic caps and also on the chip next to it. Luckily it uses a standard uh, floppy drive connector so that's good so we can at least replace it. But yeah, the PCB is not that easy to remove and uh, finding another drive that will slot into this bay will not be the easiest thing because you need to have the eject button aligned properly. There are other solutions, for example here I have a standard 3.5 inch disk drive uh, which is enclosed in a five and a quarter inch base, so this is a lot easier to replace. But for now, we're mostly interested in the C drive. So we now have a C drive letter assigned, but when we do a directory listing, we get a data error. So this was somewhat to be expected because I didn't have really high hopes of getting this hard drive up and running. So yeah, we get all kinds of uh, data error, reading errors, so that probably means that the drive is dead. So let's do an F disk, see if there are any partitions on it. So F disk now does find a fixed disk. We can see the partitions. So this is a 614 cylinder hard drive, 20 megabytes. But when we attempt to format it, we again get the same data error. So I'm currently unable to format the drive. I could perhaps try a low-level format, although I'm not really sure how to do that. But in the end, the format just fails with a invalid media or track zero bad. So let's take a closer look at the motherboard of this Philips XT PC. Now for an XT class machine, this looks like a fairly modern motherboard. It features a lot of SMD components, it has a coin cell battery, it is really compact and it has lots of I.O. on board. So you can definitely tell that this is a late XT model. So we have five 8-bit ISA slots for expansion cards. We have a keyboard connector and next to it we have two serial ports. We also have a connector to hook up the parallel port. The brain power is provided by the Siemens 8088 CPU. Of course, we also have room for an optional floating point unit. So next to the coin cell, we have the BIOS chip, which is simply marked 68256P3120. We have a coin cell, so it is able to keep track of time we have this speaker here attached to the motherboard, so there's no need for a separate PC speaker. There is a hard drive and floppy drive controller on board, provided by this Western Digital chip. The chipset is provided by Headland, a pretty popular chipset manufacturer, particularly for 286 and 386 PCs. 
The computer itself is configured using this switch block here. Here you can configure stuff like enabling, disabling the hard drive, uh, enabling, disabling serial ports, parallel ports, setting the video mode, and specifying which floppy drives are installed. So the computer comes with 768 kilobytes of RAM. There are some additional free sockets here, but obviously as you cannot address any more than 640 kilobytes under MS-DOS, there's really not much point. So around the keyboard connector, there was this weird white residue. I have no idea what that is all about. But now let's talk video options. So the other Philips PC that I had came with this ATI Small Wonder Graphics Solution 2. Now this is a card that can do uh, MDA, Hercules, CGA, and it has a couple of dip switches to configure various modes. So this is ideal if you have an old monitor that supports MDA or CGA. Now, the other Philips PC came with the 16-bit video card, which has a Chips and Technologies chip. And this chip is actually capable of doing a range of video modes, hence the fact that it has two DSUP connectors and a couple of dip switches to configure it. But this card can actually run the full range MDA, CGA, EGA, VGA modes. If you don't have such a card and you want to have VGA, you will need to try out a number of different 16-bit uh, VGA cards because obviously 8-bit VGA cards are very difficult to find but not all of these 16-bit video cards will work on an 8-bit system so in my particular case this card was the only one from the four that are shown here that actually worked on the Philips PC so if you want to get VGA output you will need to try a whole bunch of different cards and hope that some of them works. For example, this Oak card, I was pretty sure that this worked in my other IBM PC XT compatible, but on this Philips one, the MX was the only one that worked. But for now, we're going to go with this ATI Small Wonder graphics because I want to see what it looks like on various monitors. And for storage, because this hard drive is obviously dead, I'm going to go with this XT IDE solution, which is just a very simple 8-bit card that you can slot into any 8-bit ISA slot. You have various options to set the I.O. address and the ROM address. So this is a really handy card to have some flexible storage on the machine. Now, the only thing I want to point out is that the actual software that runs on this, the Universal BIOS, has its I.O. address hard-coded to 300. So this will only work when you set the I.O. address to 300. But now, let's power up the PC with the XT IDE card in it. I disabled the internal hard drive using the dip switches, but I did leave it powered on because I like the sound of it. And I hooked it up to this uh, monochrome monitor. And I personally think this looks really good on this type of PC. I mean, it is an XT class machine running at 10 megahertz with 640 kilobytes of usable memory. So you're not going to be doing too much multitasking on it. So here you can see uh, it running Check It version 3. So let's see what it gives. So here we can see it has detected the MDA video adapter. It is an 8088. The floppy drives are not configured correctly here for some reason. Now with this setup in the games department, you're going to be limited to games that support some kind of monochrome or Hercules mode. For example here, Prince of Persia runs fine in Hercules mode. Now this monitor does support both CGA and EGA modes, albeit in monochrome. But this is just to show you that you are able to run some games in Hercules mode using this setup if you only have an MDA monitor. The Cycles is another game that works pretty well in Hercules mode, so you'll be able to play that also on this type of setup. And it definitely runs a lot better than it does on the IBM PC or on the IBM PC XT because this does have somewhat of higher clock speed and some games will definitely benefit from that. Now using the jumpers on the Small Wonder graphics and the dip switches on the motherboard, it is possible to set up the computer using CGA, giving you a lot more options in the game department. 
and with the Philips uh, dual display video card you can even get it to work in EGA mode depending on the uh, dip switch settings. But if you just want to hook up an LCD uh, VGA monitor for example that's also perfectly fine. Uh, it is supported by the Philips VGA card obviously and it will allow you to play all of these games in VGA mode. So VGA is obviously a lot easier on the eye and chances that you have an uh, LCD VGA monitor lying around instead of an EGA or CGA monitor uh, is a lot higher obviously. So VGA is definitely a viable option here. But that being said, I really like this amber uh, display and it matches the computer really well. So I think I'm gonna stick with this setup for a while now. So. I really hope you've enjoyed this video, if you did please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, leaving a comment and I hope to see you guys in the next video soon, bye bye.